Today, I'm talking about The Will to Believe by William James. James was a professor at Harvard University at the end of the 19th century, and he was an influential figure in the American pragmatist movement in philosophy, and also very important in the development of modern scientific psychology. One of the things that you'll see in the course of this paper is that he was somewhat heterodox in his scientific views. He was very interested in religion and religious experience, and was also interested in contemporary study of the supernatural and paranormal, as well as psychoactive drugs. The central theme of this paper is about this idea of epistemic openness to consider things that may not be yet supported by the evidence. While many philosophers think that there's some rational conception of the way that evidence should determine everything about what you do and don't believe, James is interested in arguing first that other psychological factors do play a role in determining our beliefs, second, that this is unavoidable, and finally, that even if we could avoid the use of these other psychological factors, we would be cutting ourselves off from important parts of the truth by limiting ourselves to just what the evidence does support, though you'll see some amount of qualification of exactly what he's uh, arguing for. Interestingly, this paper was delivered as a lecture at Yale and Brown, so you see a little bit of gentle-natured ribbing of the other Ivy League universities here and there. But because it was a live lecture to a group of students, he was including a lot of examples involving current events. So this couldn't have been written at any time other than the summer of 1896. I'll include links in the descriptions below for information about more of these current events, though you could probably understand the main points of the lecture without getting all of these references. Okay, so the will to believe. In the recently published life by Leslie Stephen of his brother, Fitz James, so Fitz James Stephen was the leader of the British Conservative Party at this time, and he had been arguing against John Stuart Mill's liberalism and in favor of government required religion. So uh, Stephen says, there's an account of a school to which his brother went when he was a boy. The teacher, a certain Mr. Guest, used to converse with his pupils in this wise. Gurney, what is the difference between justification and sanctification? Stephen, prove the omnipotence of God, etc. In the midst of our Harvard free thinking and indifference, we are prone to imagine that here at your good old Orthodox college, conversation continues to be somewhat upon this order. And to show you that we at Harvard have not lost all interest in these vital subjects, I've brought with me tonight something like a sermon on justification by faith to read to you. I mean, an essay in justification of faith, a defense of our right to adopt a believing attitude in religious matters, in spite of the fact that our merely logical intellect may not have been coerced. The will to believe, accordingly, is the title of my paper. And you'll notice throughout this paper, there's a lot of confusing references as to whether he's assuming that the audience is Christian or if he's assuming that the audience is rejecting Christianity. And I think this is uh, a topic of discussion at this time in academia uh, in the United States and in England. I've long defended to my own students the lawfulness of voluntarily adopted faith. But as soon as they have got well imbued with a logical spirit, they have, as a rule, refused to admit my contention to be lawful philosophically, even though, in point of fact, they were personally all the time chock full of some faith or other themselves. I am all the while, however, so profoundly convinced that my own position is correct that your invitation has seemed to me a good occasion to make my statements more clear. Perhaps your minds will be more open than those with which I have hitherto had to deal. I will be as little technical as I can, there must begin by setting up some technical distinctions that will help us in the end. Section one, let us give the name of hypothesis to anything that may be proposed to our belief. And just as the electricians speak of live and dead wires, let us speak of any hypothesis as either live or dead. In the 1890s, electricity was a very new thing and they hadn't actually invented insulation on wires yet. So people were very careful about not touching live wires. A live hypothesis is one which appeals as a real possibility to him to whom it's proposed. If I ask you to believe in the Mahdi, the notion makes no electric connection with your nature. It refuses to scintillate with any credibility at all. The Mahdi is a figure that has been debated in Islamic theology. Some Muslims say that at the second coming of Jesus, he will be accompanied by a figure known as the Mahdi, who will be the ruler of all the Islamic peoples of the world whereas other Muslims believe that this is a later invention and not part of orthodox belief. To you, as an hypothesis, it is completely dead. 
To an Arab, however, even if he's not one of the Mahdi's followers, the hypothesis is among the mind's possibilities. It is alive. This shows that deadness and liveness in a hypothesis are not intrinsic properties, but relations to the individual thinker. That is, there's no objective fact that makes a hypothesis live or dead. It's that some hypotheses are live to you, some are dead to you. This is just a psychological fact about you and this hypothesis. Uh, they are measured by this willing, his willingness to act. The maximum of liveness in a hypothesis means willingness to act irrevocably. Practically, that means belief. But there is some believing tendency wherever there is willingness to act at all. So just consider what happens when you step outside. Uh, in some times of year, you check the weather before you step outside. In other times of year, you don't bother. You just go out dressed as you are because there's no live hypothesis about uh, what temperature it might be outside. You know what it's going to be. So the, the liveness of the possibility that it might get cold or might get hot or might rain or might snow, that is just a feature that sometimes you consider that a live hypothesis, sometimes you don't, and that affects how you act. Next, let us call the decision between two hypotheses an option. Options may be of several kinds. They may be one, living or dead, two, forced or avoidable, three, momentous or trivial. And for our purposes, we may call an option a genuine option when it is of the forced, living, and momentous kind. And now he's going to define these terms. One, a living option is one in which both hypotheses are live ones. If I say to you, be a theosophist or be a Mohammedan, it is probably a dead option because for you, neither option is, neither hypothesis is likely to be alive. Theosophy was a very trendy sort of uh, religious sect at the late 19th century that involved elements of many different religions and elements of various sorts of mysticism. But he's assuming that to students at an American university, they're just not interested in European cults or Middle Eastern religions. So they're just not going to consider either of these. But if I say, be an agnostic or be a Christian, it is otherwise. Trained as you are, each hypothesis makes some appeal, however small, to your belief. And I assume the same is true to students at many American universities today, that agnosticism and Christianity are two of the live options, whereas all the many other different religions that the world has had are not. Second, next, if I say to you, choose between going out with your umbrella or without it, I do not offer you a genuine option for it is not forced. You can easily avoid it by not going out at all. So that is an option. If it's two options, there's, a there's always a question, is there some other alternative? And he's going to be only interested in the cases where there is no other alternative. And some of this is going to be involved arguing that for certain types of questions, there really is no third alternative. He says, similarly, if I say either love me or hate me, either call my theory true or call it false, your option is avoidable. You may remain indifferent to me, neither loving nor hating, and you may decline to offer any judgment as to my theory. But if I say either accept this truth or go without it, I put on you a forced option for this, there is no standing place outside of the alternative. So that is here. It's not that the option is between believing and denying, but rather between believing and just refusing to believe, which could be denying and could be just suspending judgment. Every dilemma based on a complete logical disjunction with no possibility of not choosing is an option of this forced kind. Three, finally, if I were Dr. Nansen and proposed to you to join my North Pole expedition, your opportunity would be momentous. So Dr. Nansen here is Fritjof Nansen, who in 1895 set off on an expedition to be the first group of people to reach the North Pole. And at the time this lecture was given, he was still gone on this voyage. No one knew if he and his crew were alive, if they had made it to the pole or not. And just three weeks later, they'd finally come back. So this would probably be your only similar opportunity. And your choice now would either exclude you from the North Pole sort of, sort of immortality altogether, or put at least the chance of it into your hands. He who refuses to embrace a unique opportunity loses the prize as surely as if he had tried and failed. Per contra, on the other hand, the option is trivial when the opportunity is not unique, when the stake is insignificant, or when the decision is reversible if it later proves unwise. Such trivial options abound in the scientific life. A chemist finds a hypothesis live enough to spend a year in its verification. 
He believes in it to that extent. But if his experiments prove inconclusive either way, he's quit for his loss of time, no vital harm being done. So here, I think he's saying uh, an option is going to be momentous only if deciding or uh, to accept it or reject it now is going to lock you in for life. It's going to be a permanent decision. It will facilitate our discussion if we keep all these distinctions well in mind. So his idea is he's only going to be talking about in the end options where there's two options that are live, you have no other alternative, and whichever one you choose now, you'll be locked in. And he's going to say, in those cases, the evidence doesn't determine what you must do. And you can philosophically legitimately choose either side of that option. But uh, we'll get there. Section two. The next matter to consider is the actual psychology of human opinion. That is here in this section, he's going to consider when do we decide uh, on reasons other than evidence? Later, he's going to come to the question of when should we decide in, for reasons other than evidence? When we look at certain facts, it seems as if our passional and volitional nature lay at the root of all our convictions, that is, our feelings and our choices. When we look at others, it seems as if they could do nothing when the intellect had once said its say. Let us take up the latter facts first. Does it not seem preposterous on the very face of it to talk of our opinions being modifiable at will? Can our will either help or hinder our intellect in its perceptions of truth? Can we just by willing it believe that Abraham Lincoln's is a myth, uh, existence is a myth and that the portraits of him in McClure's magazine are all of someone else? So McClure's magazine had just a few weeks before this lecture published a big spread, including a lot of photographs of Abraham Lincoln as he was growing up. And uh, so his question is, if you just decided, I don't believe Abraham Lincoln exists, could you actually make yourself believe that? Similarly, could you make yourself believe that there is no pandemic or that Donald Trump didn't exist or that Europe doesn't exist? It seems so hard to consider that you could even decide anything like this. Belief seems to be automatic in these cases. Can we, by any effort of our will or by any strength of wish that it were true, believe ourselves well and about when we are roaring with rheumatism in bed, or feel certain that the sum of the two $1 bills in our pocket must be $100. We can say any of these things, but we are absolutely impotent to believe them. And of just such things is the whole fabric of the truths that we do believe in made up. Matters of fact, immediate or remote, as Hume said, and relations between ideas, which are either there or not there for us if we see them so, and which, if not there, cannot be put there by any action of our own. In Pascal's thoughts, or pensées, there is a celebrated passage known in literature as Pascal's Wager. In it, he tries to force us into Christianity by reasoning as if our concern with truth resembled our concern with the stakes in a game of chance. So Pascal was a mathematician and philosopher who had been, uh, was one of the first people to work out the mathematics of probability and calculate when are gambles advantageous to take and when are they disadvantageous. Translated freely, his words are these. You must either believe or not believe that God is. Which will you do? Your human reason cannot say. A game is going on between you and nature, which at the day of judgment will bring out either heads or tails. So he's saying, if you believe in God, that's like betting on heads. If you don't believe in God, that's like betting on tails. And nature has already flipped the coin. It's already either heads or tails. Weigh what your gains and your losses would be if you should stake all you have on heads or God's existence. If you win in such a case, you gain eternal beatitude. If you lose, you lose nothing at all. Uh, that is, he's saying, the benefits of believing if God does exist are infinite, whereas the costs of believing, he says nothing at all, but they're, the idea is that they're relatively small. And the idea is if someone offered you a chance to bet on a coin, whether it comes up heads or tails, and they say, I'll give you a chance to bet. If you get it right, I'll give you $100. And if you get it wrong, I'll just take 10 cents from you. I think most of us would be willing to take that bet. And he says, uh, weigh what your gains and your losses would be if you should stake all you have on heads or God's existence. If you win in such a case, you gain eternal beatitude. If you lose, you lose nothing at all. If there were an infinity of chances and only one for God in this wager, still you ought to stake your all on God. 
For though you surely risk a finite loss by this procedure, any finite loss is reasonable. Even a certain loss is reasonable if there is but the possibility of infinite gain. Go then and take holy water and have masses said. Belief will come and stupefy your scruples. Or in French, cela vous fera croire et vous abétira. Why should you not? At bottom, what have you to lose? You probably feel that when religious faith expresses itself thus in the language of the gaming table, it is put to its last trumps. Surely Pascal's own personal belief in masses and holy water had far other springs, and this celebrated page of his is but an argument for others, a last desperate snatch at a weapon against the hardness of the unbelieving heart. We feel that a faith in masses and holy water adopted willfully after such a mechanical calculation would lack the inner soul of faith's reality. And if we ourselves were in the place of the deity, we should probably take particular pleasure in cutting off believers of this pattern from their infinite reward. It is evident that unless there be some pre-existing tendency to believe in masses and holy water, the option offered to the will by Pascal is not a living option. So here he's giving us a bit more reason to think about what live means. Certainly no Turk ever took to masses and holy water on its account. And even to us Protestants, these means of salvation seem such foregone impossibilities that Pascal's logic invoked for them specifically leaves us unmoved. As well might the Mahdi write to us saying, I am the expected one whom God has created in his effulgence. You shall be infinitely happy if you confess me. Otherwise you shall be cut off from the light of the sun. Weigh then your infinite gain if I am genuine against your finite sacrifice if I am not. His logic would be that of Pascal, but he would vainly use it on us for the hypothesis he offers us is dead. No tendency to act on it exists in us to any degree. So some philosophers argue that the fact that there are multiple religions around means that Pascal's wager is just a bad bet. But that's not what William James is saying here. He's not saying that the existence of all these options means that it's a bad bet. His point is most of these options don't even occur to us and the bet isn't going to motivate us to believe these things. That believing isn't the sort of thing that you can motivate by this sort of consideration unless it's already a live option. So he says, this is a psychological point. It's not a philosophical point about what you should believe. It's a psychological point about what you can believe. The talk of believing by our volition seems then, from one point of view, simply silly. From another point of view, it is worse than silly. It is vile. So here he's getting to the more standard philosophical argument about what you should believe. When one turns to the magnificent edifice of the physical sciences and sees how it was reared, what thousands of disinterested moral lives of men lie buried in its mere foundations, what patience and postponement, what choking down of preference, what submission to the icy laws of outer fact are wrought into its very stones and mortar, how absolutely impersonal it stands in its vast augustness, then how besotted and contemptible seems every little sentimentalist who comes blowing his voluntary smoke wreaths and pretending to decide things from out of his private dream. Can we wonder if those bred in the rugged and manly school of science should feel like spewing such subjectivism out of their mouths? The whole system of loyalties which grow up in the schools of science go dead against its toleration, so that it is only natural that those who have caught the scientific fever should pass over to the opposite extreme and write sometimes as if the incorruptibly truthful intellect ought positively to prefer bitterness and unacceptableness to the heart in its cup. So this passage has all sorts of emotional and flowery language on behalf of science as this impartial uh, way of thinking. And there he's doing a little satire of William Clifford in his paper, The Ethics of Belief. Uh, I'll link to my video about that paper in the description below. But the idea is that Clifford says, there's all this work that's gone into making human belief be this objective thing. And here this guy comes and tells us, gamble with your beliefs instead of treating them with this sort of solemnity. And Clifford is using that as an argument against the uh, legitimacy of believing according to Pascal's method. It fortifies my soul to know that though I perish, truth is so, sings Clough. While Huxley exclaims, my only consolation lies in the reflection that however bad our posterity may become, so far as they hold by the plain rule of not pretending to believe what they have no reason to believe because it may be their, to their advantage so to pretend, 
they will not have reached the lowest depth of immorality. And that delicious enfant terrible Clifford writes, belief is desecrated when given to unproved and unquestioned statements for the solace and private pleasure of the believer. Whoso would deserve well of his fellows in this matter will guard the purity of his belief with a very fanaticism of jealous care, lest at any time it should rest on an unworthy object and catch a stain which can never be wiped away. If a belief has been accepted on insufficient evidence, even if the belief is true, as Clifford on the same place explains, the pleasure is a stolen one. It is sinful because it is stolen in defiance of our duty to mankind. That duty is to guard ourselves from such beliefs as from a pestilence which may shortly master our own body and then spread to the rest of town. It is wrong always, everywhere, and for everyone to believe anything on insufficient evidence. So these paragraphs is where James is giving the view of the philosophers that he's eventually going to try to rebut. They are saying, not only is it impossible to believe things by matter of uh, choice or free will, but they're saying it's wrong. It's morally wrong to believe things without sufficient evidence. And this is what James is going to argue against. Section three, all of this, that is uh, the idea that you shouldn't believe things if you don't have evidence, strikes one as healthy, even when expressed as by Clifford with somewhat too much of robustious pathos in the voice. Free will and simple wishing do seem in the matter of our credences to be only fifth wheels to the coach. So that is, as you said at the beginning of section two, most of the time, it seems like we can't just choose what to believe. Yet, if anyone should thereupon assume that intellectual insight is what remains after wish and will and sentimental preference have taken wing, or that pure reason is what then settles our opinions, he would fly quite as directly in the teeth of the facts. So he's saying, even though we don't usually have choices about what to believe, that doesn't mean that our pure reason automatically governs what we believe. It's only our already dead hypotheses that our willing nature is unable to bring to life again. But what has made them dead for us is, for the most part, a previous action of our willing nature, of an antagonistic kind. When I say willing nature, I do not mean only such deliberate volitions as may have set up habits of belief that we cannot now escape from. I mean all such factors of belief as fear and hope, prejudice and passion, imitation and partisanship, the circumpressure of our caste and set. That is what our friends and family believe. As a matter of fact, we find ourselves believing. We hardly know how or why. Mr. Balfour, who is a British uh, a member of parliament at this time, gives the name of authority to all those influences born of the intellectual climate that make hypotheses possible or impossible for us, alive or dead. Here in this room, we, all of us, and I think here is being a little sarcastic, believe in molecules and the conservation of energy, in democracy and necessary progress, in Protestant Christianity and the duty of fighting for the doctrine of the immortal Monroe, all for no reasons worthy of the name. Think about that. Consider your own political views. You can probably list a bunch of the views of your party, but you probably don't have good reasons for why your party's views, as precisely stated, are clearly better than the alternative. We see into these matters with no more inner clearness and probably with much less than any disbeliever in them might possess. His unconventionality would probably have some grounds to show for its conclusions. But for us, not insight, but the prestige of the opinions is what makes the spark shoot from them and light up our sleeping magazines of faith. Magazines are places where you've stored explosives. So he's saying our belief is like this explosion that's set off by sparks, but the sparks aren't given by evidence. They're just given by what seems like the prestigious opinion. Think about this. There are people out there who believe that the earth is flat. And most of us, if we were faced with one of those people, those people would probably know all sorts of details about the sorts of evidence that there is for and against this hypothesis, which we just don't know. We are almost certainly right that the earth is round. But those flat earthers are probably the people who know the evidence best. Therefore, it's not the evidence that's making us believe. It's just the fact that everyone else believes it. Our reason is quite satisfied in 999 cases of every thousand of us, if it can find a few arguments that will do to recite in case our credulity is criticized by someone else. Our faith is faith in someone else's faith. And in the greatest matters, this is most the case. 
So that is, he's saying again, think about your belief that the earth is round. You probably know a bunch of things to say to a flat earther, but the flat earther is very familiar with those things and has arguments against them. And you probably have not heard most of the actual arguments that the flat earthers have. They've got more evidence, whereas we know the standard things to recite. And the same thing is going to be true for our political beliefs, our religious beliefs. And by our political beliefs, I include things like democracy and the fact that we should elect people to office. Why is that good? Our belief in truth itself, for instance, that there is a truth and that our minds and it are made for each other. What is it but a passionate affirmation of desire in which our social system backs us up? We want to have a truth. We want to believe that our experiments and studies and discussions must put us in a continually better and better position towards it. And on this line, we agree to fight, our, fight out our thinking lies. But if a Pyrrhonistic skeptic asks us how we know all this, can our logic find a reply? No, certainly it cannot. The Pyrrhonian skeptics are an ancient group of skeptics who say every single belief that you think you have is uncertain. There's always a possibility that you're wrong. So you can't know anything. And uh, there, many thousands of years of philosophy has never found a secure response to this, though many philosophers have claimed to. It is just one volition against another. We willing to go in for life upon a trust or assumption, which he, for his part, does not care to make. So the idea is that most of us, most philosophers, believe that it is possible to know things and it is possible to figure out some facts by investigation. Whereas the skeptic says, no, it's impossible to do that. And James says, there's no reason in our favor. Instead, he's going to argue it's something else. As a rule, we disbelieve all facts and theories for which we have no use. Clifford's cosmic emotions find no use for Christian feelings. Huxley, who's an important social Darwinist and biologist at the time, belabors the bishops because there's no use for sacerdotalism in his scheme of life. He was arguing that uh, uh, people should be religious, but they should do it in their own personal way, not through the bishops. Newman, who was an important cardinal at the time, on the contrary, goes over to Romanism and finds all sorts of reasons good for staying there because a priestly system is for him an organic need and delight. Why do so few scientists even look at the evidence for telepathy, so-called? Because they think, as a leading biologist now dead once said to me, that even if such a thing were true, scientists ought to band together to keep it suppressed and concealed. It would undo the uniformity of nature and all sorts of other things without which scientists cannot carry on their pursuits. You can think of perhaps other contemporary scientific controversies where some people might believe that scientists are just covering up the evidence of an alternative to their theories because they think that this theory would under, undermine the entire scientific pursuit. But if this man had been shown something which as a scientist he might do with telepathy, he might not only have examined the evidence, but even have found it good enough. So that is, he's saying, someone working in one version of science might think we should hide any evidence of telepathy because it might undercut all of science. But if they had figured out what could we do with the science of telepathy, then maybe he'd be happy to accept it. This very law, which uh, the logicians would impose upon us, if I may give the name of logicians to those who would rule out our willing nature here, is based on nothing but their own natural wish to exclude all elements for which they, in their professional quality of logicians, can find no use. Evidently then, our non-intellectual nature does influence our convictions. There are passional tendencies and volitions which run before and others which come after belief. And it's only the latter that are too late for the fair. So that is, he's saying, if you already find yourself believing something, you can't choose now to reject that belief or to adopt a new one just by, out of your own free will. But features of your character that came before you formed your belief could well uh, have that sort of effect. They're not too late when the previous passional work has been already in their own direction. Pascal's argument, instead of being powerless, then seems like a regular clincher and is the last stroke needed to make our faith in masses and holy water complete. The state of things is evidently far from simple and pure insight and logic, whatever they might do ideally, are not the only things that really do produce our creeds. So that is, he's now said, uh, 
sure, we can't just decide what to believe, but there are features other than evidence that do shape what we believe. And most of us believe things not really because of evidence, but really because everyone else believes them and we want to go along. And so then he's going to consider eventually the question, should this be the case? Section four, our next duty, having recognized this mixed up state of affairs, is to ask whether it be simply reprehensible and pathological, or whether, on the contrary, we must treat it as a normal element in making up our minds. The thesis I defend is, briefly stated, this. Our passional nature, that is our feelings, our values, our desires, things like that, not only lawfully may, but must decide an option between propositions. Whenever it is a genuine option, remember genuine means live, forced, and momentous, that cannot by its nature be decided on intellectual grounds. For to say, under such circumstances, do not decide, but leave the question open, which is what Clifford wants us to do, is itself a passional decision, just like deciding yes or no, and is attended with the same risk of losing the truth. The thesis thus abstractly expressed will, I trust, soon become quite clear, but I must first indulge in a bit more of preliminary work. Section five. It will be observed that for the purposes of this discussion, we are on dogmatic ground. Ground, I mean, which leaves systematic philosophical skepticism altogether out of account. The word dogmatic is sometimes used to mean people who believe things for no good reason, but in philosophy, it's just used for the rejection of skepticism. Skepticism here means the, uh, the doubting of any belief whatsoever. So anyone who thinks that you can believe things at all legitimately is dogmatic in the philosophical sense. The postulate that there is truth and that it is the destiny of our minds to attain it, we are deliberately resolving to make, though the skeptic will not make it. We part company with him, therefore, absolutely at this point. But the faith that truth exists and that our minds can find it may be held in two ways. We may talk of the empiricist way and of the absolutist way of believing in truth. And here he's going to use the word empiricist somewhat differently from how other philosophers use it. The absolutists in this matter say that we not only can attain to knowing truth, but we can know when we have attained to knowing it. Whereas the empiricists think that although we may attain the truth, we cannot infallibly know when. To know is one thing and to know for certain that we know is another. One may hold to the first being possible without the second. Hence, the empiricist and the absolutist, although neither of them is a skeptic in the usual philosophic sense of the term, show very different degrees of dogmatism in their lives. So just to uh, repeat, absolutists in James's terms are people who believe that there is some method you can use that will guarantee that you found the truth when you use it. Whereas empiricists for James are people who believe it is in fact possible to find the truth through our investigations, but none of our investigations can ever infallibly prove that we have the truth. All of our beliefs are fallible. All of our knowledge is fallible. And this is different from other philosophical uses of the word empiricism, which are usually about the distinction between beliefs had through pure reason and beliefs had through the senses. James is thinking both the beliefs through the reason and the beliefs through the senses have some amount of fallibility to them, but also have the possibility of reaching the truth. That's the kind of empiricism he wants to defend. If we look at the history of opinions, we see that the empiricist tendency has largely prevailed in science, while in philosophy, the absolutist tendency has had everything its own way. This is quite different a century and a half later. These days, I think most contemporary philosophers accept what James calls the empiricist view. The characteristic sort of happiness indeed, which philosophies yield has mainly consisted in the conviction felt by each successive school or system that by it, bottom certitude had been attained. Other philosophies are collections of opinions, mostly false. My philosophy gives standing ground forever. Who does not recognize in this the keynote of every system worthy of the name? A system, to be a system at all, must come as a closed system, reversible in this or that detail perchance, but in its essential features, never. So he's saying most theorists in the history of philosophy have claimed to 
reject the old views while finding some new solid foundation that they think is unassailable, that they will build the new search for truth on. Scholastic orthodoxy, so this is philosophy of the 1400s and 1500s, to which one must always go when one wishes to find perfectly clear statement, has beautifully elaborated this absolutist conviction in a doctrine which it calls that of objective evidence. Uh, if, for example, I am unable to doubt that I now exist before you, that two is less than three, or that if all men are mortal, then I am mortal too. It is because these things illumine my intellect irresistibly. And here he's referring to some ideas from Descartes, who says, there are certain things that we see with clear and distinct perception, and those things must be true. The fact that I exist, the fact that two is less than three, the fact that certain logical inferences are valid. And this is the same sort of thing that many theologians and other uh, religions have thought too. Aquinas and Al-Ghazali both believe that on seeing the light of God, you're able to have certainty of some things. And now he's going to use a lot of Latin terminology because this Latin terminology was common in the scholastic uh, uh, philosophy that had been adopted by the Catholic Church, but was very influential in European philosophy for several centuries. The final ground of this objective evidence possessed by certain propositions is the adequation intellectus nostri cum re, that is, it's the, the fitting of our intellect with the thing. The certitude it brings involves an aptitudinem ad extorquendem certum assensum on the part of the truth envisaged. That is, it's an ability to extort the certainty uh, from our senses. And on the side of the subject, a quietum in cognitione, that is, a resting in our cognition. When once the object is mentally received, that leaves no possibility of doubt behind. And in the whole transaction, nothing operates but the entitas ipsa of the object and the entitas ipsa of the mind, that is, the thing itself. We slouchy modern thinkers dislike to talk in Latin. Indeed, we dislike to talk in set terms at all, but at bottom, our own state of mind is very much like this whenever we uncritically, uncritically abandon ourselves. You believe in objective ed evidence and I do. Of some things we feel that we are certain. We know and we know that we do know. There is something that gives a click inside of us, a bell that strikes 12 when the hands of our mental clock have swept the dial and meet over the meridian hour. So here he's saying, much of the time, we even if we explicitly reject this sort of absolutist belief, the idea that there could be a thing that just perfectly reveals itself in a way that not only can't, but shouldn't be doubted, we do act as though that's the case with most of the foundational beliefs of our lives. The greatest empiricists among us are only empiricists on reflection. When left to their instincts, they dogmatize like infallible popes. You can see there's a lot of little anti-Catholic sentiments hidden throughout this thing. And I'm sure it has something to do with the religious views of Americans of the late 19th century. When the Cliffords tell us how sinful it is to be Christians on such insufficient evidence, insufficiency is really the last thing they have in mind. For them, the evidence is absolutely sufficient, only it makes the other way. They believe so completely in an anti-Christian order of the universe that there is no living option. Christianity is a dead hypothesis from the start. So I think what he's saying here is the scholastics are trying to tell us that there's a certain type of sensation that means that we should believe something, which is that if something is revealed to us clearly in its religious light, then we must believe it. And James is saying, they're not right. We should be empiricists. We should think everything is fallible, but all of us do subconsciously adopt this kind of uh, thinking that there's all sorts of things that we just won't question and we won't uh, give up. Um, and that's just a psychological necessity for us. And even people like Clifford that are trying to argue for using sufficient evidence to believe things, think it's not about sufficiency. They, he's just, James is here psychologizing Clifford and thinking Clifford has just managed to suppress Christianity in his beliefs. And therefore it's not that he thinks there's insufficient evidence, it's that he doesn't even think Christianity is a possibility. Section six. But now, since we are all such absolutists by instinct, what in our quality of students of philosophy ought we to do about the fact? Shall we espouse and endorse it? Or shall we treat it as a weakness of our nature from which we must free ourselves if we can? 
I sincerely believe that the latter course is the only one we can follow as reflective men. Objective evidence and certitude are doubtless very fine ideals to play with, but where on this moonlit and dream visited planet are they found? I am therefore myself a complete empiricist so far as my theory of human knowledge goes. I live to be sure by the practical faith that we must go on experience and thinking over our experience for only thus can our opinions grow more true. But to hold any one of them, I do not care which as if it could never be reinterpretable or corrigible. I believe that to be a tremendously mistaken attitude. And I think that the whole history of philosophy will bear me out. There is but one indefectibly certain truth, and that is the truth that Pyrrhonistic skepticism itself leaves standing, the truth that the present phenomenon of consciousness exists. That is the truth that I exist, because I can tell that I'm having some sort of thoughts and sensations. And even if I'm completely deceived about anything, everything, maybe even deceived about my own past and my own continued existence, I can't be deceived about the fact that I currently am thinking. That, however, is the bare starting point of knowledge, the mere admission of a stuff to be philo philosophized about. The various philosophies are but so many attempts at expressing what this stuff really is. And if we repair to our libraries, what disagreement do we discover? Where is a certainly true answer found? Apart from abstract propositions of comparison, such as that two and two are the same as four, propositions which tell us nothing by themselves about concrete reality, we find no proposition ever regarded by anyone as evidently certain that has not either been called a falsehood or at least had its truth sincerely questioned by someone else. The transcending of the axioms of geometry, not in play, but in earnest by certain of our contemporaries as Zollner and Charles H. Hinton, and the rejection of the whole Aristotelian logic by the Hegelians are striking instances in point. That is, he's saying, maybe we can't doubt the propositions of basic arithmetic. But many people have thought that geometry and logic were just as certain as arithmetic. And yet there are contemporary late 19th century philosophical schools that doubt geometry and arithmetic. And interestingly, the people he's quoting here, we're just talking about four dimensional geometry, which to modern mathematicians is not a revolution in geometry at all. They think the more interesting one is the non-Euclidean geometry, which Einstein in fact seems to have shown may be true of the real world, that maybe the 2000 years of what was thought of as absolute certainty in geometry by Europeans before that was actually all strictly speaking false. And some people are rejecting logic too. No concrete test of what is really true has ever been agreed upon. Some make the criterion external to the moment of perception, putting it either in revelation, the consensus gentium, the instincts of the heart or the systematized experience of the race. So that is, some people say, it's not your moment of believing that tell, tests whether something is true, but it's maybe the fact that your belief is written in scripture, or the fact that your belief is the consensus of the people, or the fact that your belief is an instinct in the human heart, or the fact that your belief is somehow built out of the systematized social uh, views. Others, though, make the perceptive moment its own test. Descartes, for instance, with his clear and distinct ideas guaranteed by the veracity of God, Thomas Reed with his common sense, and Immanuel Kant with his forms of synthetic judgment a priori. The inconceivability of the opposite, the capacity to be verified by sense, the possession of complete organic unity or self-relation realized when a thing is its own other. I think that's a Hegelian idea. All of these are standards which in turn have been used. The much lauded objective evidence is never triumphantly there. It is a mere aspiration or grenzbegriff, marking the infinitely remote ideal of our thinking life. Grenzbegriff is just German for boundary concept. And I think the idea is people propose all sorts of tests for when you can know something to be infallibly true. But the fact that they keep disagreeing and no one of them is so obviously better than any other suggests to him that if there is such an infallible ideal, it's something that we can never reach. We can only get closer and closer to. To claim that certain truths now possess it, this absolute certainty, is simply to say that when you think them true and they are true, then their evidence is objective, but otherwise it is not. But practically, one's conviction that the evidence one goes by is of the real objective brand is only one more subjective opinion added to the lot. For what a con contradictory array of opinions have objective evidence and absolute certitude been claimed? 
So here he's going to list a whole bunch of things that philosophers have claimed are objectively and absolutely certainly true, and they contradict each other. The world is rational through and through. That is, there's an explanation for everything. There's a reason for everything. Its existence is an ultimate brute fact. There's no explanation for why there is something rather than nothing. There is a personal God, or a personal God is inconceivable. There is an extra mental physical world immediately known. That's what most of us believe and what many philosophers have taken as the starting point of, as philosophy, or the mind can only know its own ideas. That's Descartes' idea. The physical world is the absolute uncertainty and only the mind is certain. A moral imperative exists. That's the idea that there's moral facts or obligation is only the resultant desires. It's all just about your opinions. A permanent spiritual principle is in everyone. That is, there is such a thing as the self that persists and continues through time and is immortal and is unified. Or there are only shifting states of mind. That's more like the Buddhist idea that there's just things that go on in my head and there's nothing that makes them parts of the same person. There's an endless chain of causes. That is, time goes back forever or there's an absolute first cause. An eternal necessity or a freedom? A purpose or no purpose? A primal one or a primal many? A universal continuity or an essential discontinuity in things? An infinity, no infinite. There is this, there is that. There is indeed nothing which someone has not thought absolutely true while his neighbor deemed it absolutely false and not an absolutist among them seems ever to have considered that the trouble may all the time be essential and that the intellect, even when it has the truth directly in its grasp, may have no infallible signal for knowing whether it be truth or no. When indeed one remembers that the most striking practical application to life of the doctrine of objective certitude has been the conscientious labors of the holy office of the inquisition, one feels less tempted than ever to lend the doctrine a respectful ear. But please observe now that when, as empiricists, we give up the doctrine of objective certitude, we do not thereby give up the quest or hope of truth itself. We still pin our faith on its existence and still believe that we gain an ever better position towards it by systematically continuing to roll up experiences and think. Our great difference from the scholastic lies in the way we face. The strength of his system, the scholastic, lies in the principles, the origin, the terminus a quo of his thought. Terminus just means the end point and a quo means from which it comes. So that is, the scholastic thinks what's essential is that you form your beliefs in the right sort of way. You need to derive them from the right principles. That's what is good. But for us, the empiricist, the strength is in the outcome, the upshot, the terminus ad quem, the end point to which we're going. Not where it comes from, but where it leads to is to decide. It matters not to an empiricist from what quarter an hypothesis may come to him. He may have acquired it by fair means or by foul. Passion may have whispered or accident suggested it. But if the total drift of thinking continues to confirm it, that is what he means by its being true. So he's saying, uh, so here, one of the classic examples of this is that the chemist Kekule, who discovered the structure of the benzene atom, it apparently came to him in a dream. But the important point is, it doesn't matter how the idea came to him. The important point is, he continues to investigate it in the world and everything he investigates keeps reinforcing it. And even if it never achieves absolute certainty, the empiricist and pragmatist idea that James is going for is the idea that we can hope to get closer and closer to the truth. There is no source that guarantees the truth. All we can hope for is a method that will eventually bring us closer to it. Whereas he thinks the absolutist wants to find a solid foundation that guarantees truth and only believe the things that can be guaranteed and James thinks that can't be had. There is one thing that he says at the end here that is important to the pragmatists that many contemporary philosophers will de uh, debate, which is that he says, this is what he means by its being true. What it means to be true on this picture is just that it will continue to be reinforced by observation. Many other philosophers think, no, what it means to be true is that it's the case in reality, that there is a world out there and it has facts about it, whether or not we can ever know them. And hopefully the investigation tends to uh, reach them. Whereas for the pragmatist, whatever the investigations tend to lead towards, that just is the truth.
but the idea is the empiricist doesn't think anything can guarantee truth, but still believes in truth and still believes we can approach it. Section seven. One more point, small but important, and our preliminaries are done. There are two ways of looking at our duty in the matter of opinion, ways entirely different, and yet ways about whose difference the theory of knowledge seems hitherto to have shown very little concern. First, we must know the truth, and second, we must avoid error. These are our first and great commandments as would-be knowers, but they are not two ways of stating an identical commandment. They are two severable laws. Although it may indeed happen that when we believe the truth A, we escape as an incidental consequence from believing the falsehood B, it hardly ever happens that merely by disbelieving B, we necessarily believe A. We may, in escaping B, fall into believing other falsehoods, C or D, just as bad as B. Or we may escape B by not believing anything at all, not even A. So that is his point is, we want to believe things that are true, and we want to not believe things that are false. But uh, anything you do that makes you believe more things will get you more truths, but also get you more falsehoods. Anything you do that makes you believe fewer things will lose some falsehoods, but also lose some truths. There's a trade-off here, and we have to decide how that trade-off plays out. Believe truth shun error. These, we see, are two materially different laws, and by choosing between them, we may end by coloring differently our whole intellectual life. We may regard the chase for truth as paramount and the avoidance of error as secondary, or we may, on the other hand, treat the avoidance of error as more imperative and let truth take its chance. Clifford, in the instructive passage which I have quoted, exhorts us to the latter course. Believe nothing, he tells us. Keep your mind in suspense forever, rather than by closing it on insufficient evidence, incur the awful risk of believing lies. You, on the other hand, may think that the risk of being in error is a very small matter when compared with the blessings of real knowledge, and be ready to be duped many times in your investigation, rather than postpone indefinitely the chance of guessing true. I myself find it impossible to go with Clifford. We must remember that these feelings of our duty about either truth or error are in any case only expressions of our passional life. That is, it's, it's our own feelings about truth and falsehood that, that, that tell us how to balance these two commandments. Biologically considered, our minds are just as ready to grind out falsehood as veracity. And he who says, better go without belief forever than believe a lie, merely shows his own preponderant private horror of becoming a dupe. He may be critical of many of his desires and fears, but this fear he slavishly obeys. He cannot imagine anyone questioning its binding force. For my own part, I have also a horror of being duped, but I can believe that worse things than being duped may happen to a man in this world. So Clifford's exhortation has, to my ears, a thoroughly fantastic sound. It's like a general informing his soldiers that it's better to keep out of battle forever than to risk a single wound. Not so our victories, either over enemies or over nature gained. Our errors are surely not such awfully solemn things. In a world where, where we are so certain to incur them in spite of all of our caution, a certain lightness of heart seems healthier than this excessive nervousness on their behalf. At any rate, it seems the fittest thing for the empiricist philosopher. So his point is, there are all sorts of rules you can follow that guarantee that you won't believe anything false, but those also prevent you from believing a lot of truths. And following Clifford, he suggests, would be like a general who is so concerned with the safety of his troops that he never engages in battle once. And maybe sometimes that's a good policy, but that's not going to be a very effective general strategy for winning a war. And if the war matters, then it matters that you sometimes win and not just that you never lose. Section eight. And now, after all this introduction, let us go straight at our question. I have said and now repeat it, that it is not only as a matter of fact that we find our passional nature influencing us in our opinions, but that there are some options between opinions in which this influence must be regarded both as inevitable and as a lawful determinant of our choice. So that is, as a matter of fact, people are affected by things other than evidence in how they believe. Second, this is inevitable. Uh, our evidence is never sufficient to force us to believe things. 
And third, not only is this inevitable, but it's the right thing that ideal humans would still have their beliefs shaped by factors other than evidence. And this is what he's going to get to. I fear here that some of you, my hearers, will begin to scent danger and lend an inhospitable ear. Two first steps of passion you have indeed had to admit as necessary. We must think so as to avoid dupery, and we must think so as to gain truth. But the surest path to those ideal consummations you will probably consider is from now onwards to take no further passional step. Well, of course, I agree as far as the facts will allow. Wherever the option between losing truth and gaining it is not momentous, we can throw the chance of gaining truth away, and at any rate, save ourselves from any chance of believing falsehood by not making up our minds at all till objective evidence has come. And so remember, momentous means for him that if a decision is momentous, then once you've made it, you have no chance of turning back. When Nansen comes to you and says, I'm about to go to the North Pole, do you want to join me or not? If you come, you'll have a chance of being the first part of the first crew ever to make it to the North Pole. If you don't, you will never be part of the first crew to make it to the North Pole. If it's not like that, if you always are going to have another chance, he says, sure, don't bother believing, figure it out later. In scientific questions, this is almost always the case. And even in human affairs in general, the need of acting is seldom so urgent that a false belief to act on is better than no belief at all. Law courts, though, do have to decide on the best evidence available for the moment because the judge's duty is to make law as well as to ascertain it. So that is, he's saying, a judge often has to believe things on insufficient evidence because they have to make a decision on the case. They, don't, they can't just wait forever. Whereas most of us can wait we, it doesn't matter whether we believe someone is guilty or not in most cases. As a learned judge once said to me, few cases are worth spending much time over. The great thing is to have them decided on any acceptable principle and got out of the way. But in our dealings with objective nature, we obviously are recorders, not makers of the truth. That is in figuring out the laws of physics and so on. Decisions for the mere sake of deciding promptly and getting on to the next business would be wholly out of place. Throughout the breadth of physical nature, facts are what they are quite independently of us, and seldom is there any such hurry about them that the risks of being duped by believing a premature theory need be faced. The questions here are always trivial opinions. The hypotheses are hardly living, or at least not living for us spectators. The choice between believing truth or falsehood is seldom forced. The attitude of skeptical balance is therefore the absolutely wise one if we were to escape mistakes. What difference indeed does it make to most of us whether or not we have a theory of the Röntgen rays, whether we believe or not in mind stuff or have a conviction about the causality of conscious states? Röntgen was a physicist in Germany in, who in late 1895 discovered that when he was doing certain experiments, there were these images appearing on his photographs that were in the next room. And uh, uh, he put his hand in front of it and took a picture and saw the bones of his hand. And this was front page news in all the newspapers. No one knew what was going on. So he just called them the X-rays because X stood for unknown. Nowadays, we have all sorts of uses for X-ray technology and we understand them. But in 1896, this was just some weird new thing that had been detected. And William James says, I don't know what X-rays are, but it doesn't matter whether I know what X-rays are. Someday we may be able to figure it out. Mind stuff, this is actually an idea of William Clifford himself, he puts forward in some of his other philosophy. And William James says, Clifford, who's such a skeptic in some places, seems to have these philosophical theories and he accepts them. Why do we have to believe them? I don't know what the mind is made of. It doesn't matter. I don't need to make that decision now. I'll always, always have a chance to decide later. Such options are not forced on us. On every account, it is better not to make them, but still keep weighing reasons pro et contra with an indifferent hand. I would speak here, of course, of the purely judging mind. For purposes of discovery, such indifference is to be less highly recommended. So here he's saying someone who's not in investigating the science, but someone who's just an observer of science doesn't have to believe things. But someone who's actually trying to discover facts may need to actually make beliefs. Science would be far less advanced than she is if the passionate desires of individuals to get their own faiths confirmed had been kept out of the game. See, for example, the sagacity which Spencer and Weissman now display. These were two uh, biologists in the late 19th century who were having 
a lot of debates for and against various aspects of the theory of evolution. And each one was heavily invested in his side of the debate. And they came up with all sorts of interesting new arguments. Surely at least one of them was wrong, but he thinks the fact that they believed with the truth of their convictions meant led them to come up with all sorts of new arguments, which then helped other people investigate. On the other hand, if you want an absolute duffer in investigation, someone who'll be useless, you must, after all, take the man who has no interest whatever in its results. He's the warranted and capable, the positive fool, the most useful investigator because the most sensitive observer is always he whose eager interest in one side of the question is balanced by an equally keen nervousness lest he become deceived. Science has organized this nervousness into a regular technique, her so-called method of verification, and she has fallen so deeply in love with the method that one may even say she has ceased to care for truth by itself at all. It is only truth as technically verified that interests her. I think about the contemporary medical establishment. In many cases, they don't even care, in a sense, whether vaccines do or don't work. They care about, has there been a scientific study that proves that they work? That's the only thing that they care about, at least in the, many of their official announcements. The truth of truths might come in, come in merely affirmative form, and she would decline to touch it. Such truth as that, she might repeat with Clifford, would be stolen in defiance of her duty to mankind. Human passions, however, are stronger than technical rules. Le cœur a ses raisons, as Pascal says, que la raison ne connaît pas. The heart has its reasons that reason cannot know. And however indifferent to all but the bare rules of the game, the umpire, the abstract intellect may be, the concrete players who furnish him the materials to judge of are usually, each one of them, in love with some pet live hypothesis of his own. So that is, even if someone is a dispassionate observer of science, all the evidence is coming from the passionate researchers who are engaged in defending their own pet theories. Let us agree, however, that wherever there is no forced option, the dispassionately judicial intellect with no pet hypothesis, saving us as it does from dupery at any rate, ought to be our ideal. The question next arises, are there not somewhere forced options in our speculative questions? And can we, as men who may be interested at least as much in positively gaining truth as in merely escaping dupery, always wait with impunity till the coercive evidence shall have arrived? It seems a priori improbable that the truth should be so nicely adjusted to our needs and powers as that. In the great boarding house of nature, the pancakes and the butter and the syrup seldom come out so even and leave the plate so clean. Indeed, we should view them with scientific suspicion if they did. Section nine, moral questions immediately present themselves as questions whose solution cannot wait for sensible proof. A moral question is a question not of what sensibly exists that is detectable by our senses, but of what is good or what would be good if it did exist. Science can tell us what does exist, but to compare the worths both of what does exist and what does not exist, we must consult not science, but what Pascal calls our heart. Science herself consults her heart when she lays it down that the infinite ascertainment of fact and correction of false belief are the supreme goods for men, as in that's a value judgment. Challenge the statement that truth is important and avoiding falsehood. Science can only repeat it or accurately or else prove it by showing that such ascertainment and correction bring man all sorts of other goods, which man's heart in turn declares. So that is, if someone's going to try to prove to you why it's better to believe true things than false things, they're probably going to prove it by saying, well, if you believe true things, you can get these other things you want, but that's still coming down to the things you want. There's some value judgment, fundamentally. The question of having moral beliefs at all or not having them is decided by our own will. Are our moral preferences true or false? Or are they only odd biological phenomena, making things good or bad for us, but in themselves indifferent? How can your pure intellect decide? Is there objective moral truth? Is there objective right and wrong or not? Is it actually wrong to commit genocide or is that just like our opinion? If your heart does not want a world of moral reality, your head will assuredly never make you believe in one. Mephistophelian skepticism. I think this is the kind of person who doubts that there is any moral truth, who says it's all just our opinions and it 
we should just be nihilistic and do what we want because there's no moral reality. Mephistophelian skepticism indeed will satisfy the head's play instincts much better than any rigorous idealism can. Some men, even at the student age, are so naturally cool hearted that the moral hypothesis never has for them any pungent life. And in their supercilious presence, the hot young moralist always feels strangely ill at ease. The appearance of knowingness is on the side of the skeptic, of naivety and gullibility on the side of the moral realist. Yet in the inarticulate heart of him, he clings to it that he is not a dupe and that there is a realm in which, as Emerson says, all of their wit and intellectual superiority is no better than the cunning of a fox. Moral skepticism can no more be refuted or proved by logic than intellectual skepticism can. When we stick to it that there is truth, be it of either kind, we do so with our whole nature and resolve to stand or fall by the results. And the skeptic with his whole nature adopts the doubting attitude, but which of us is the wiser? Omniscience only knows. Turn now from these wide questions, <coughs> turn now from these wide questions of good to a certain class of questions of fact, questions concerning personal relations, states of mind between one man and another. Do you like me or not, for example? Whether you do or not depends in countless instances on whether I meet you halfway. I'm willing to assume that you must like me and show you, tr show you trust and expectation. The previous faith on my part in your liking's existence in such cases is what makes your liking come. But if I stand aloof and refuse to budge an inch until I have objective evidence, until you have done something apt, as the absolutists say, ad extra quendum ascensum meum, ten to one your liking never comes. If I wait for you to force me to believe that you like you, me, you probably aren't going to like me. How many women's hearts are vanquished by the mere sanguine insistence of some man that they must love him? I think he hasn't heard of the Me Too movement here. <laughs> He will, not, uh, he will not consent to the hypothesis, they cannot. The desire for a certain kind of truth here brings about that special truth's existence. And so it is in innumerable cases of other sorts. Who gains promotions, boons, appointments, but the man in whose life they're seen to play the part of live hypotheses? Who discounts them, sacrifices, sacrifices other things for their sake before they have come and takes risk for them in advance. That is, you're never going to get your promotion if you don't believe that you're the kind of person who's worthy of a promotion. The belief has to come before the evidence and then it makes it true. His faith acts on the powers above him as a claim and creates its own verification. A social organism of any sort, whatever, large or small, is what it is because each member proceeds to his own duty with a trust that the other members will simultaneously do theirs. Wherever a desired result is achieved by the cooperation of many independent persons, its existence as a fact is a pure consequence of the precursor of faith in one another of those immediately concerned. A government, an army, a commercial system, a ship, a college, an athletic team, all exist on this condition, without which not only is nothing achieved, but nothing is even attempted. There wouldn't be social groups if people didn't believe that these social groups existed before there was evidence of them. A whole train of passengers, individually brave enough, will be looted by a few highwaymen simply because the latter can count on one another, while each passenger fears that if he makes a moment of resistance, he will be shot before anyone else backs him up. If we believed that the whole carful would rise at once with us, we should each severally rise and train robbing would never even be attempted. There are then cases where a fact cannot come at all unless a preliminary faith exists in its coming. And where faith in a fact can help create the fact, that would be an insane logic which would say that faith running ahead of scientific evidence is the lowest kind of immorality into which a thinking being can fall. That is, he's saying, if the way that you create a fact is by believing in it, then you shouldn't wait until after the fact exists and then the evidence comes before you believe it, because that would be just to deny the fact at all. Yet such is the logic by which our scientific absolutists pretend to regulate our lives. So here he said, there's certain kinds of social facts where if you have a rule of not believing them until after the evidence has come in, then they'll never exist. And if these things are valuable, then that means sometimes we should believe before the evidence comes and our belief will turn out to be right. If belief in the truth can be valuable, then in these cases, he thinks, it can uh, 
justify believing before there's evidence. Section 10. In truths dependent on our personal action, then, faith based on desire is certainly a lawful and possibly an indispensable thing. But now, it will be said, these are all childish human cases and have nothing to do with great cosmical matters like the question of religious faith. Let us then pass on to that. Religions differ so much in their accidents that in discussing the religious question, we must make it very generic and broad. What then do we now mean by the religious hypothesis? Science says things are. Morality says some things are better than other things. And religion says essentially two things. First, religion says the best things are the more eternal things, the overlapping things, the things in the universe that throw the last stone, so to speak, and say the final word. Perfection is eternal. This phrase of Charles Secretan seems a good way of putting this first affirmation of religion an affirmation which obviously cannot yet be verified scientifically at all. The second affirmation of religion is that we are better off even now if we believe this first affirmation. So here you can see he's abstracted away from all the details of Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and is claiming to come at some universal religious idea and saying, religion claims there are certain things that are true about eternity, eternity, and religion claims that it's better for us right now if we believe this, even if we don't have the evidence. Now, let us consider what the logical elements of this situation are in case the religious hypothesis in both its branches really be true. Of course, we must admit that possibility at the outset. If we're to discuss the question at all, it must involve a living option. If for any of you, religion be a hypothesis that cannot by any living possibility be true, then you need go no further. I speak to the saving remnant alone. So, so he's saying, he's not trying to argue to you that you should be considering religion as a live option. He's just saying, if religion is a live option for you, and I think he means religion in this very abstract sense, not particular religion, he's going to now give us an argument that it's legitimate to believe it, even though there's no evidence. So proceeding, we see first that religious, religion offers itself as a momentous option. Remember, momentous means if you say no now, you're actually costing yourself. You can't just come back and change your mind later. We are supposed to gain, even now by our belief, and to lose by our non-belief, a certain vital good. Secondly, religion is a forced option so far as that good goes. We cannot escape the issue by remaining skeptical and waiting for more light, because Although we do avoid error in that way if religion be untrue, we do lose the good if it be true, just as certainly as if we positively chose to disbelieve. It is as if a man should hesitate indefinitely to ask a certain woman to marry him because he was not perfectly sure that she would prove an angel after he brought her home. Would he not cut himself off from that particular angel possibility just as decisively as if he went and married someone else? Skepticism then is not avoidance of option, it is an option of a certain particular kind of risk. Better risk loss of truth than chance of error. That is your faith feeder's exact position. He is actively playing his stake just as much as the believer is. Both of them are gambling. He is backing the field against the religious hypothesis, just as the believer is backing the religious hypothesis against the field. To preach skepticism to us as a duty until sufficient evidence for religion be found is tantamount, therefore, to telling us when in presence of the religious hypothesis, that to yield to our fear of its being error is wiser and better than to yield to our hope that it be true. It is not intellect against all passions then. It is only intellect with one passion, fear, laying down its law. And what, forsooth, is the supreme wisdom of this passion warranted? Dupery for dupery, what proof is there that dupery through hope is so much worse than dupery through fear? I, for one, can see no proof. And I simply refuse obedience to the scientist's command to imitate his kind of option in a case where my own stake is important enough to give me the right to choose my own form of risk. If religion be true and the evidence for it be still insufficient, I do not wish by putting your extinguisher upon my nature, which feels to me as if it after all had some business in the matter, to forfeit my sole chance in life of getting upon the winning side. That chance depending, of course, on my willingness to run the risk of acting as if my passional need of taking the world religiously might be prophetic and right. 
all this is on the supposition that it really may be prophetic and right, and that even to us who are discussing the matter, religion is a live hypothesis, which may be true. Now, to most of us, religion comes in a still further way that makes a veto on our active faith even more illogical. The more perfect and more eternal aspect of the universe is represented in our religions as having personal form. The universe is no longer a mere it to us, but a thou if we are religious. And any relation that may be possible from person to person might be possible here. For instance, although in one sense we are passive portions in the universe, in another we show a curious autonomy, as if we were small active centers on our own account. We feel too as if the appeal of religion to us were made to our own active good goodwill, as if evidence might be forever withheld from us unless we met, met the hypothesis halfway. To take a trivial illustration, just as a man who in a company of gentlemen made no advances, asked a warrant for every concession and believed no one's word without proof, would cut himself off by such churlishness from all the social rewards that a more trusting spirit would earn, so here, one who should shut himself up in snarling logicality and try to make the gods extort his recognition willy-nilly or not get it at all, might cut himself off forever from his only opportunity of making the gods acquaintance. So just as he said, if you wait for other people to prove that they're trustworthy before you trust them, you'll never get that trust. Similarly, if the universe is this personal thing, if it has this personal element of the gods, then if you wait for the gods to prove their existence to you, you may never get that. This feeling forced on us, we know not whence, that by obstinately believing that there are gods, although not to do so would be so easy for both for our logic and our life, we are doing the universe the deepest service we can. This feeling seems part of the living essence of the religious hypothesis. If the hypothesis were true in all its parts, including this one, then pure intellectualism with its veto on our making willing advances would be an absurdity. And some participation of our sympathetic nature would be logically required. I therefore, for one, cannot see my way to accepting the agnostic rules for truth seeking or willfully agree to keep my willing nature out of the game. I cannot do so for this plain reason that a rule of thinking which would absolutely prevent me from acknowledging certain kinds of truth, if those kinds of truth were really there, would be an irrational rule. So here he's providing a criterion of rationality, that a rational rule should say that for every truth that could exist, it should at least, there should at least be some legitimate method of getting at it. If your rule says there are certain types of truths which you could never legitimately get, then he thinks it's a bad rule. We should find some other rule that might allow us to get them even if it comes at some other cost. Of course, then we would have to decide which of those costs are worth it. But he's saying it can't just be objectively illegitimate to do anything that could ever let you get a certain kind of truth. That for me is the long and short of the formal logic of the situation, no matter what the kinds of truth might materially be. I confess, I do not see how this logic can be escaped. But sad experience makes me fear that some of you may still shrink from radically saying with me, in abstracto, that we have the right to believe at our own risk any hypothesis that is live enough to tempt our will. I suspect, however, that if this is so, it is because you have got away from the abstract logical point of view altogether, and are thinking, perhaps without realizing it, of some particular religious hypothesis which, for you, is dead. The freedom to believe what you will you apply to the case of some patent superstition and the faith you think of is the faith defined by the schoolboy when he said, faith is when you believe something that you know ain't true. I can repeat that this is misapprehension. In concreto, the freedom to believe can only cover living options, which the intellect of the individual cannot by itself resolve. And living options never seem absurdities to him who has them to consider. When I look at the religious question as it really puts itself to concrete men, and when I think of all the possibilities which both practically and theoretically it involves, then this command that we shall put a stopper on our heart, instincts and courage and wait, acting of, the course, of course, meanwhile, more or less as if religion will not true, till doomsday or till such time as our intellect and senses working together may have raked in evidence enough, this command, I say, seems to me the queerest idol ever manufactured in the philosophic cave. That is, he's saying, if this command is that we always have to uh, 
prevent ourselves from believing things until we have evidence. And that by preventing ourselves, he notes that preventing ourselves from believing things is acting as if it's false. Here's his footnote. He says, since belief is measured by action, he for, who forbids us to believe religion to be true necessarily also forbids us to act as we should if we did believe it to be true. The whole defense of religious faith hinges upon action. If the action required or inspired by the religious hypothesis is in no way different from that dictated by the naturalistic hypothesis, then religious faith is a pure superfluity, better pruned away and controversy about its legitimacy is a piece of idle trifling unworthy of serious minds. I myself believe, of course, that the religious hypothesis gives to the world an expression which specifically determines our reactions and makes them in a large part unlike what they might be on a purely naturalistic scheme of belief. That is, he's saying, he's only considering belief if the belief can make a difference to your actions. Anything that can't make a difference to your actions, get rid of that because that's not really belief. But he thinks there is something about religion that does make a difference to your concrete daily life. And uh, if there's some rule that tells us never believe such a thing and therefore never go along with it until after you have the evidence, then this command is just another idol. Were we scholastic absolutists who thought that there was some objective test of certainty, there might be more excuse. If we had an infallible intellect with its objective certitudes, we might feel ourselves disloyal to such a perfect organ of knowledge in not trusting to it exclusively, in not waiting for its releasing word. But if we are empiricists, if we believe that no bell in us tolls to let us know for certain when truth is in our grasp, then it seems a piece of idle fantasticality to preach so solemnly our duty of waiting for that bell. Indeed, we may wait if we will. I hope you do not think that I'm denying that. But if we do so, we do so at our peril just as much as if we believed. In either case, we act, taking our life in our hands. No one of us ought to issue vetoes to the other, nor should we bandy words of abuse. We ought, on the contrary, delicately and profoundly to respect one another's mental freedom. Then only shall we bring about the intellectual republic. Then only shall we have that spirit of inner tolerance without which all our outer tolerance is soulless and which is empiricism's glory. Then only shall we live and let live in speculative as well as in practical things. I began by a reference to Fit James Stevens. Let me end by a quotation from him. And remember, Fitz James Stephen is a conservative at this time who thinks everyone should be forced to believe in the official state religion. What do you think of yourself? What do you think of the world? These are questions with which all must deal as it seems good to them. They are riddles of the Sphinx, and in some way or other, we must deal with them. In all important transactions of life, we have to take a leap in the dark. If we decide to leave the riddles unanswered, that is a choice. If we waver in our answer, that too is a choice. But whatever choice we make, we make it at our peril. If a man chooses to turn his back altogether on God in the future, no one can prevent him. No one can show beyond reasonable doubt that he is mistaken. If a man thinks otherwise and acts as he thinks, I do not see that anyone can prove that he is mistaken. Each must act as he thinks best. And if he is wrong, so much the worse for him. We stand on a mountain pass in the midst of whirling snow and blinding mist, through which we get glimpses now and then of paths which may be deceptive. If we stand still, we shall be frozen to death. If we take the wrong road, we shall be dashed to pieces. We do not certainly know whether there is any right one. What must we do? Be strong and of a good courage. Act for the best, hope for the best, and take what comes. If death ends all, we cannot meet death better. So overall, his point is, unlike many traditional religious philosophers who thought we can find some ground of certainty on which to base our religion, James thinks there's no way to get any certainty in the world. However, he does think it's possible to get at the truth. Of course, he thinks there's nothing that forces us to believe this. But if we don't believe that, then it doesn't really matter what we believe. If we believe it's possible to get at the truth, then he thinks we, all we can do is get at the truth with uncertainty. There is no certain guide to our beliefs. And since there is no certain guide, that means there are going to be questions where we think both options are live. There's no choice other than to believe or to not believe. And that believing or not believing is already going to get me at some good.
And in those cases, he thinks, there can be no objective rule that tells you which side to take because any such rule is going to cut you off from one option or the other inevitably. And he thinks no rational rule can do that. And then the question is, what are those cases? He thinks some of those cases arise in interpersonal matters and some of those cases arise in very fundamental metaphysical questions about the nature of reality. And he makes some suggestions that those fundamental metaphysical questions may have some connections to the social questions. That in particular is the claim of religion in some of its forms. He even says things like, for the scientist, sometimes it's essential that the scientists have the belief so that they can fight it out so that the rest of us can have the evidence. But for most of us, scientific matters are the sort of thing that we don't need to take an opinion on. We can just wait for the scientists to have an answer. Of course, that changes if you're living through a pandemic or other sort of catastrophe. Then maybe you do need to have uh, beliefs about the science. And our evidence is never going to be sufficient to absolutely settle the questions, but we still have to make a belief one way or the other. And he's telling us there is no rule for doing this. And so it's going to come down to some features of our personal psychology. And this is not just a contingent matter of fact about humans as these imperfect beings that we are, but it's actually essential for any sort of being that isn't uh, idealized and guaranteed to reach the truth.